Yes, 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 who got brands talking? Brandlife.co.za Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the show, Crime Uncovered. My name is Solka, for those of you who don't know that yet, and I will spell it again for you. It's S-I-L-K-E. It is a German name, hence the unusualness of my name. On Crime Uncovered, we talk about all things crime, and I'm very, very excited for today's show. I have two people who have joined me in the studio, Warren and Justin. Welcome to the show, Warren and Justin. Thanks for having us. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure and very, very nice to, uh, to have you both here. And again, thank you for coming through today. Um, I know we've had a bit of a chat before the show and I was already intrigued and I've got lots of questions for you. Just to give our listeners a bit of a background, both Warren and Justin are addicts. They are going to speak for themselves today. So the very first question I want to ask is, Justin, may I ask you, what was your drug of choice? Um, my drug of choice was heroin and crack, but um, I'd use anything there was. But if I could choose, it would always be heroin. All right. And Warren, what was your drug of choice? My drug of choice was the same as Justin. I'd always choose heroin, but I think along the line, anything that came along that made me feel good, that was my drug of choice for the day. All right. And Warren, how long were you an addict for? I started using heroin 10 years ago. But I think my first obsession, the, the drug I first got introduced to, like so many people, was alcohol. At eight years old, I discovered the stuff called booze, and it made me feel good. And it just progressed from there till I found heroin. Okay. And Justin, for how long have you been clean for? I've been clean for almost eight years, since the 13th of September 2010. So it's been quite a few days behind my back, um, a lot of life-changing experience. Well, from the bottom of my heart and soul, congratulations to you both for being clean today and for being on the show and doing something that you both told me is completely normal or maybe a little bit abnormal for you to be on the radio. And um, the next question I want to ask you is, there, so I know that there's different addictions. So we talk about an addict, but there's people who use drugs, alcohol, sex. There's also even religion that I did some research on, and it's called religiosity. Is there a difference between an addict and an occasional user? Justin, would you please answer that question? I think if we look at what the DSM-5 defines addiction as, it says it's a compulsive, persistent use of a substance. Um, so that would speak against um, occasion. Occasion is not persistent or compulsive. I think that every addiction starts occasionally, um, it might not end occasionally, so um, there is a huge difference, you know, between persistent compulsive use versus occasional use. That is so, so interesting because I myself could have a glass of wine. I wouldn't even be able to finish that glass of wine. But I know that there are other people who would never be able to keep a bottle of wine in their kitchen cupboard. It would burn a hole in their brain until that was consumed. And that's obviously talking about alcoholism. And Warren, I want to ask you something. There is a perception that all addicts steal. And in particular, I would say, you know, me as a polygraphist, I would say that a person that is addicted to drugs would steal. That is synonymous. The perception is that that let me use the word, and it's a very harsh word that I'm using, but a drug addict would steal. Would this be true in your in your experience? You know, Soka, I think addiction's a great thief. I think addiction takes, it steals fathers away from their children. Mm -hmm. It steals sons from their mothers. Mm -hmm. um, there, there is theft that happens within workplaces. You know, addicts do steal. But there's a defining factor for addicts. An addict is someone who cannot stop using when they want to. And when they're using, drinking, they cannot control the amounts that they use or drink. And, and that's not true for all addicts. You get your addicts who, who live in Santon and they have their multi-million rand homes and companies and they don't steal in the conventional sense. There's no need for them to steal. They can financially afford their habit. They can feed their habit. But we need to look at the theft of the father from their son. We need to look at the son from their mother and all the things that addiction steals, the beauty from life that's stolen by addiction. 
I think that addiction, when it necessitates theft, yes, it happens. There's the Nyaupe addict in mm-hmm. Soweto who, mm-hmm. who, you know, he steals to feed his addiction. Um, there's the guy who works in a spare shop who, who's going to steal parts and sell them on his own private basis to feed his addiction. So it's it's synonymous, yes, but it's not a prerequisite for defining addiction. All right. Can I ask you something? Would a sex addict be at high risk of stealing? I think sex addiction is, is a rather personal thing, as with all addiction, and and it's very different for all sex addicts. There's a lot of sex addicts who have an obsession with prostitutes, and that requires money, just like yes. crack cocaine, heroin, um, drugs require money. That's their drug, and if they're in a position where they cannot afford it, stealing happens. Um, you spoke about people in Santon who have the three cars and probably the house, you know, in Durban mm-hmm. and the house up here, the mansion up here. And you said that those people would not need to steal. Would those people progress to such a stage in their addiction that their lives become unmanageable, mm-hmm. that they would no longer be able to retain or maintain their jobs mm-hmm. and eventually would lose their jobs or even their businesses? I think that's that's quite a common thing that <clears throat> okay. we hear about happening quite a lot, multimillionaires landing up on the park bench. It's not always what happens. I think rock bottom, a lot of people confuse that rock bottom is all about being on the park bench, having no one left. For me, I understand rock bottom to be a set of feelings. It's mm-hmm. a set of feelings defined by loneliness, extreme loneliness and extreme fear. And that set of feelings can be brought on by a whole bunch of different circumstances. Um, For me, at the end of my addiction, I really had lost everyone and I had nowhere left to turn. But for the the guy with the business and the two houses at the coast, perhaps his mother stopped speaking to him. Um, One of his adult children cut contact with him. His his marriage gets put in a place Mm -hmm. where divorce is threatened. And that rock bottom, those set of feelings are brought on by that for him, whereas for myself, it was brought on by absolutely no one left, um, terribly addicted to opiates by myself in the back of a whorehouse with no one left in the world. So it's a very personal thing, rock rock bottom. Warren, you're breaking my heart here. I'm getting quite emotional when you speak. Truly, I am. Um, There was something else I wanted to ask you. Addiction, Mm -hmm. when it really has escalated to a point, does it always make your life unmanageable? I think so. And once again, that unmanageability is different for each and every person. It's it's an internal thing. Um, External manifestations, such as losing the job, um, the stealing, the criminal side of it, getting arrested, um, the medical... um, what would I call it, the medical consequences, mm-hmm. the physical consequences, but that unmanageability is, it's, it's vast and it's broad and it's different for each and every addict. Okay. When I wrote my book about drug addicts, um, I came to understand very clearly that they are incredibly lonely and mm-hmm. that they do feel mm-hmm. isolated mm-hmm. and they cannot take part mm-hmm. in normal human life because going out to a dinner is impossible for them because they're on edge wanting their next fix, mm-hmm. whatever that mm-hmm. next fix is. Um, so would it be true to say that only your dealer truly understands you because some of the drug addicts that I interviewed for my book said to me, only my dealer truly understands me. Warren or Justin, either one of you may answer. You can both answer. Um, Justin, I'll hand it over to you. <laughs> good question. Uh, it's quite funny. Uh, my, my dealer understanding me, I think he just wants to sell me anything. Okay. You know? uh, for me, I found a lot of solace in the other addicts on the streets. You know? okay. um, birds of a feather flock together. Uh-huh. And um, I thought that the people on the streets understood me. You know, The guys who I was using with... Um, the relationships would only last so long because, like, otherwise I have to share. Mm-hmm. Um, but okay. like, like Warren was answering and, and he was saying so brilliantly is the isolation and desperation that I feel within myself. It doesn't matter who's around. I'm always going to feel that. That mm-hmm. is like one of the hallmarks of addiction, you know, is that I can have people around. I can have people who tell me they love me and who care about me like my father, but yet still f- feel so completely isolated difference Mm -hmm. and alone Mm -hmm. you you know so um 
to answer your question, I, I don't know if my dealer really understood me. He he made like he did because I'm giving him money. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, yes. so of course he loved me. Yes, because you're you're his business. <laughs> you support his money, business, not yes. my money. But yes. yeah. <laughs> and and yes. I really like what Justin had to say about there. Uh, say there about finding solace with other addicts out there. I think for me in my twelve step fellowship today, it's very much the same. I find a lot of solace and I really feel comfortable around people who have the same thing as me, being the disease of addiction. But very important for you, I would think, would be that you will be with recovering addicts or recovered addicts. That going, that dealing or associating yourself with active addicts is Mm -hmm. just not an answer for you. It's not an option for you right now as you go ahead in your recovery. Would I be correct? When that was what my life was all about, using drugs and living in active addiction, those people had the same agenda as me. Yes. Today my agenda is recovery. Today my agenda is bettering my life and being a better member of society. So I surround myself with people who've been there and who have that same agenda as me. Yes. Do you find you have a sense of normality now? Wow. Incredibly so, incredibly so. And it can be overwhelming at times. I'm in early recovery and at times it can be rather rather overwhelming and rather abnormal to me, the normality that so many people just consider to be everyday life. Yes, because for me, my life is basically normal. But I think for you, it's maybe very different. And Justin, you've had years of recovery, so you do normal things every day. But as Warren just said, he's quite new in recovery and... I think that normalness is very new for you. Mm, indeed. And maybe a blessing as well. Oh, yes. Yes. Most certainly. Okay, so the next question I want to ask you is in criminology, and I've told this to my listeners before, the major cause of crime across the world is a lack of a strong father figure. So what happens is that the male children are more vulnerable to becoming part of a criminal justice system, and the female children will go for these bad boys. Because, you know, we love bad boys. We love a story to tell and an adventure to have. And, of course, there are billions of boys and girls who grew up without a strong father figure who still flourish despite the lack. My question is, is it true that most addicts do not have a strong father figure? Um, Silke, there's still so much we're finding out about addiction and okay. why addiction is recognized as a disease by the World Health Organization and SAM, the American Society on Addiction and Medicine. Um, what the closest links we have are hereditary. Mm-hmm. Um, we have developmental stage trauma, mm-hmm. um, which can be anywhere from the ages of three till 12, um, a divorce, um, a loved one leaving, mother, father, changing of schools. But it's also, it's, it's like looking at the world and going, okay, so who's allergic to peanuts? If alcohol or an addiction is almost an allergy or an adverse reaction to certain substances, um, why is it just amongst few people and not amongst everyone? If, mm-hmm. we, if we look today, we say 90% of the world does not have addiction or addiction tendencies. Only 10% of the world does. Um, and that's in kind of a lot of studies that I've been looking at lately. But because it's such a broad spectrum thing where they're still finding out so much about it, um, you can't say it's lack of a father figure. Okay. You can't say it's... This person grew up well and this person grew up bad. Mm-hmm. Um, there's still so many links. What we're looking at is how does the brain function under the use of drugs mm-hmm. and alcohol, um, that reward system of the brain. A- and that's mostly where they're seeing a lot of where addiction comes from is the reward system or the survival instinct part of the brain. Um, I think it's called the hedonic part of the brain. Yes. And the functioning within that part of the brain, that does not speak to a father figure, a mother figure, or the way I grew up. It talks about how my brain functions. Um, Just as uh, being allergic or having an allergy to a certain substance doesn't talk to, I'm allergic to peanuts because I don't have a dad. I see. (laughs) You you know, addiction is considered a disease today, you know. I want to understand, Justin. Um, so are you telling me that addiction, let's talk about a drug addiction in this matter. Are you telling me it's an allergy almost or that it is an allergy or there's still studies to be done, but maybe the studies are leaning towards the fact that it's an allergy? Well, I talk more about an Oxford Dictionary definition. Okay. If you look up the word allergy in the dictionary, it says an adverse reaction, reaction mm-hmm. to certain substances. Yes. Uh, my reaction was adverse. 
Uh, I use drugs. I use it for the rest of my life, every day, in and out, put my family aside, still end up in jail. For me, end up HIV positive because I share needles where everything you've been taught and you grow up says don't share needles, don't do this, don't steal, don't do any of those things. So what what would my reaction be? It would be adverse. Correct. Um, so I think we could liken it then to what the dictionary definition says in allergy. Um, I'm not saying it is an allergy. Um, but it feels like that for you. And probably that word adverse reaction sounds real for you. Well, and that's good enough for to, me. To you, if, if you look at my reaction, you would be like, that is complete insanity. Mm-hmm. How can you do that? You're mm-hmm. stealing, you're robbing from your family, you sharing needles. That is not a normal reaction. Yes. And I look at I you, you and say we go out, we go have a cup of coffee, you have a glass of wine. You have one glass, you order another one, you only have half of it, you leave half and you leave the restaurant. To me, that reaction is adverse. Right. Uh, I'm like, <laughs> but I live in the that? normal world. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> how, how can you leave half a glass behind? Where are you going? Yes. So who's wrong? Right, I hear you. <laughs> Excepting, of course, that addiction makes our lives unmanageable yeah. and we lose everything. And so therefore it does, I think there's, it leaves a hole in the soul. And Justin, just before we go to an ad break, I want to say that um, I can hear that drugs, you definitely paid a price for that, huge price. But I think maybe the blessings, which we'll discuss a little bit later after the ad break, are huge. And Warren will also touch on that for you. So um, listeners, please stay um, tuned. We're going to a quick ad break and we will be back with more questions. In your face, all over the place. Boy. 247 24/7. You're listening to the hottest internet station. Grand Line. No doubt. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, may I have your attention, please? The witty tatterbots join myself, Carmen Murray, and my double trouble, Jessica McIndoo, with our big personalities. And we will present you with an insightful yet fun show. We will feature interviews with industry heavyweights and unpack everything from new technologies, marketing trends, and case studies to empower you to be ahead of the curve. Join us on this exciting journey every Tuesday morning at 10 o'clock and start a conversation on hashtag Witty Show. Hashtag W I T E E Show. Thank you. The Dramatic Talk with myself, Bongani Drama. Bringing you insightful conversations on the Convo Corner, your latest celebrity news on Dramatainment, and your latest fashion news on Fashion Fade. This is Bongani, Bongani, Bongani. And myself, Rose Vataka. Bringing you your latest news and sports updates. Every Wednesdays, 2 to 3 p.m. Only on www.brandlife.co.za. And welcome back to Crime Uncovered, where we talk about all things crime. Today, I have two incredible people with me, actually. I actually feel like I need to stand up at this point and give them both a standing ovation. They are discussing the addiction to drugs, but we are discussing addiction in general. Warren, we were talking to Justin earlier on, and he said, which I've heard many times before, that Drugs is actually an allergy. Mm-hmm. How do you feel about drugs with you? Do you also feel it was an allergy with you? Or do you feel there was a mental obsession or maybe an enchantment with drugs? Mm-hmm. Would you please elaborate a little bit on that, what it was for you? You know, Silke, the other part of uh, drug addiction that mm-hmm. defines it from a peanut allergy is that I have this obsession, this obsession to use drugs normally without the adverse reaction, um, that when I stop, I... Uh, immediately start convincing myself over a period of time that I can do it again. And this adverse reaction, it, it's really appropriate because so many times in my life I've tried to use drugs under circumstances that would, in my mind, not have them become unmanageable. Okay. Use just on weekends, use just after work, smoke just dacha, um, drink just alcohol, everything to try avoid my drug of choice and the unmanageability which which is part of my life. The adverse reaction means that when I just smoke that joint after abstinence, 
I'll end up back on heroin. I can't control the amount of weed I smoke and I can't control the drugs that I take thereafter. And then when I want to stop, the adverse reaction is that I find myself unable to stop. Okay. Right. All right. So oh, that's quite intense. Thank you very much, Warren. I'm really learning a lot and I hope our listeners are learning a lot. I think I will look at addicts mm. with maybe a kinder heart and a more compassionate heart in future. And a big thing with the adverse reaction as well is that once I take one, it's it's almost an allergy that this this phenomenal thing called craving kicks in mm-hmm. where, where I want to just have one joint. But next thing I know, I'm smoking a third, fourth, fifth joint and going to get crack and heroin. Okay. So it's this it's this allergy that that kicks in this craving that I'm absolutely powerless over. I may have said before that joint, I'm just going to smoke a joint. As soon as that drug enters my body, I become powerless over how much, what drug I take, and where I land up after that. You actually lose all control. It's as if yes. the drug is as if the addiction controls you, mm-hmm. and you are not controlling the addiction, even though you might try and convince yourself at times that you are able to. Yes, that's the mental obsession, trying to convince myself that I can drug like other people who don't have the disease of addiction. Mm-hmm. And talking about Dacha, Justin, question for you, and I'm very keen to hear this answer because I do consider you an expert in this. Do you think Dacha should be classed as a drug? And if so, why? Again, a beautiful question, very debatable, um, and a lot of opinions to both sides. You okay. Know? Um, I'll counteract it with a question. Should Mopridol be considered a drug? It's a headache tablet. No, has, because I use that. That has <laughs> codeine in it. But yet it is, oh. classed, it is classed as a Schedule 3. Okay. And I think that anything we're really taking pharmaceutically or whatever it is, is considered a drug. I, I don't understand why marijuana should be considered differently. Um it will have a classification. It needs to be classified, mm-hmm. just like alcohol is mm-hmm. considered a drug. It doesn't mean or speak to the difference between legality or not. Are there medicinal uses for marijuana? Brilliant medicinal uses. The cannabis oil. You, you know, really good for cancer patients. Um, there's also medicinal uses for morphine. Uh, if I use morphine compulsively or persistently, um, it's also physically addictive. Same with Mipridol or Sindol or marijuana might not have that physical addiction to it. But if I use it consistently for three years and then I don't use that night, I'm going to battle to sleep. Mm. I think to have it classified doesn't cause any harm. It doesn't speak to whether it should be legal or not or whether I can use it pharmaceutically or medically. Um, I know for someone like me, and I, I believe in the freedom of choice and the freedom of people, and I choose to not use marijuana, and it's because of what Warren said. I just can't stop. Okay. <laughs> you know, once I do, I don't <laughs> stop. And I think we have choice as human beings, and um, it's a very powerful thing that we sometimes forget, you know, that how powerful the six-letter word like choice can be. Yes. And I chose to use marijuana not knowing that I was going to be of the addictive nature. And I couldn't stop. And every time I got in and I looked at it as a lower drug um, and I'd stopped heroin, and so I go back and I use marijuana, I find myself back on heroin. Mm. And I think as an individual, you, you need to know who you are. Mm-hmm. Because is it true that marijuana then, let me go this one step further, because you see, I have my own opinion about Dacha being a polygraphist. I am very wary of putting people forward for employment who smoke Dacha simply because I know that often it is the gateway drug. Have many people died of a heroin overdose or cocaine overdose that have not smoked Dacha as their first drug of choice? Yes, I, th- I think, like I said, it's such a bo- broad spectrum okay. treatment mm. right. industry that mm. we're dealing with the vigil individuals and not a certain one. I see. Everyone is different. If mm. you ask the two people sitting here, where did we start? We will say cigarettes, alcohol, and then marijuana. Mm. So you have two out of two here at the moment. Yes. But if we take 100, it, it might be different, you know. Are you saying you started with marijuana? Um, cigarettes and cigarettes, alcohol. Cigarettes, alcohol, okay. myself, okay. alcohol yes. as well. And I think people often focus on dacha, but they forget the fact that alcohol is a drug. It's a drug available in a lot of different bottle sizes, different flavors. It's legal. 
but alcohol is as much of a drug as marijuana. Yes. And in my opinion, um, a lot more people die drunken driving than driving intoxicated on marijuana. Um, alcohol probably of all the drugs causes the most death and consequences within mm-hmm. society. So on legality, as Justin said, that's a different discussion. But alcohol is a drug, marijuana is a drug, codeine is a drug, sleeping tablets are a drug. The definition is not based on the legality, in my opinion. And as Warren said, last year the study said the world's most harmful drug is alcohol. There we are. Drug that is driving, a... domestic abuse. Yes. Um, yes, it domestic violence. the most harm. Mm. That um, is very scary because I can go into a bottle store right now and buy as much alcohol as I would like to. I'm not going to, but um, I could easily do that. And I think what we are also saying here is that a drug is anything that controls the brain. Because as you were talking about my Mypridol and Dacha, I'm thinking, no, but Mypridol doesn't control my brain. It takes the headache away and I maybe take one or two every six months because obviously I'm not an addict. But if I had my brain wired in that way, I would probably end up taking a lot of Mypridol and mm-hmm. therefore it would start making my life unmanageable. Mm-hmm. Whereas I could probably smoke Dacha and not even inhale it. So I have tried Dacha once when I was 19 and Mandrax. I thought I was a cool dude. Let me tell you, I was not cool. I took one puff of that and I don't know how anybody, anybody can take a second puff of marijuana. It's completely beyond me. But that is by the grace of God, go I. I am not a, an addict mm-hmm. for drugs. Maybe ice cream and biscuits, but <laughs> <laughs> all legal things. <laughs> but obviously, we won't go there today. All right. So um, I've heard about, we've all heard about tough love. And now there's a new thing called harm reduction, which is fairly new out there in the, and I see just, uh, I see Warren smiling. Warren is obviously very passionate about this. And I'm going to uh, throw this question to you, Justin, and please feel free to also add on if you'd like to, Warren. What is the difference between tough love and harm reduction? So, again, um, I suppose tough love is about no longer enabling your loved one. It's about allowing them to go out there and hit their bottom. Um, whereas harm reduction is the controlled use of, um, so controlling your loved one. There, there are various aspects to okay. harm reduction. If we look at a societal harm reduction, say that Holland, Portugal has, and Switzerland have done, and they're even starting to do in, in Pretoria, is giving clean needles, reducing HIV AIDS rates, you, you know, um, providing drug replacement therapy like um, Suboxone and Methadone and reducing the harm that a person can cause to themselves uh, and to society and their loved ones. We're enabling um, or tough love is the complete letting go and allowing someone to do what they need to do so that they can hit their bottom and hopefully ask for help. Okay. So um, harm reduction as as a main strategy, a country strategy, it's a great strategy. It's not an end of the line solution. Okay. So you would use that with better school prevention programs, better health care, better treatments, um, like the Portugal plan where better outpatient programs, community based outpatient programs. It doesn't help I go into Hillbrow and I hand out needles and yes, everyone's still shooting up, but at least they're not passing on HIV AIDS or any of those yes. things. It it doesn't speak to us as a better society or wanting more, or expecting more. So mm-hmm. It's a great beginning of the, the part solution, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. but it's got to be a multi a multi approach. Mm-hmm. Okay. We have to start wrapping up. We are out of time and I'm not even through all my questions. Justin, one very quick, quick question, please. And just answer very appreciate for me, please. What keeps you from using drugs? It's a good question. In the beginning, I just didn't want to sleep another night in the streets. Okay. Um, today... Um, the beautiful life that I've built. I have a beautiful son. I've got a partner. I've got relationships with my dad again. I'm healthy. I feel joy in my heart. I've done a lot of internal spiritual work, therapeutic work, all of those things. And I think what keeps me clean today is me and um, the decision I make every morning to ask the beautiful universe and the God of my understanding to help me stay clean another day. I hope anybody who's been listening today and is struggling with any kind of addiction that you've listened and you've learned something. Warren, for you, I know you'd like to be working right now. 
it's exceedingly clear to me that you are super intelligent. And I know you hate it when I say this to you, <laughs> but you obviously have superior intelligence. And I know this because I do polygraph testing. Mm-hmm. So I've picked that up, we know, when I first met you. So um, what job would you like to have? What do you think you'd be good at? You know, Silka, I'd really like to work in sales. I'm quite a self-motivated person and I carry that in my recovery. And I believe sales is an awesome place because you get to work and you get to earn based on your motivation. Yes. So I have placed, um, as a polygraphist, I have placed people who were addicted to drugs. Mm -hmm. And I want to say that those people are thriving in their jobs, all of them. I've never made an error. I've wanted to know what keeps them clean. And when they've told me and I've believed them, I have put them forward. So I know that their commitment to their 12-step program does keep them clean and the fact that they want to prove something to themselves and excel. And I think for a person in recovery from addiction, honesty, integrity, those aren't just things that I do to feel good they're things that my very life depends on. Yes. If I don't live that way I'm going to pick up drugs again and I'm going to die and today I choose life. Today I choose to live and I need to live that way in order to have a life beyond my wildest dreams. Do you see Justin and I nodding vigorously because we love that answer. That brings us to the end of our show. Warren, any shout outs for anybody today? I'd like to say happy birthday to a really special friend of mine, Singer, and let him know I love him lots and thank him for the part he plays in my recovery. Um, All my friends, uh, especially my good friend Grant, my friend Simon, I want to thank Justin. Justin's been a massive part of my recovery and You know, I learn so much from this man every day and I I love him very much as well. And I want to give a special shout out to a man from Lanasia South from the fellowship there from a place called BTC. His name's Manny. Um, Uncle Manny, thank you for saving my life, boss. I will forever pay back that debt of gratitude by trying to do the same for other people. And I love you lots as well, Uncle Manny. Thank you. And I want to say to both of you, thank you so much for being on the show. You have left me an emotional wreck, actually, as you can see. And uh, may you always both walk in the light. Can and I may- give one more to my sponsor, Charlton? Yes. Thank you, boss. Love you as well. All right. Can, can I give one quick? My yes. soulmate, my beautiful partner and the mother of our, of our child, my girlfriend, whose birthday it is today. Happy and, birthday, young lady. And I woke up next to her this morning and... Um, you woke up not using, which is a wonderful, yeah. wonderful achievement. Next to her with our son lying there. And oh. I'd just like to thank her for everything she's done for me and loving me for me. Mm. May the universe shine its light upon you. And may you both just keep on with your journey. And thank you for being on the show. I'm sure that many people learned something today. And those who will be listening to podcasts, I'm sure that they too will learn something. I've definitely learned something. And as I say, I will definitely be looking upon addicts with with much more compassion. Um, To the listeners, that brings us to the end of our show today. Please tune in again on the first Monday in March when I will have a very nice show for you. I'm going to keep it a surprise for now. Um, Chat soon. Stay safe. You're listening to brandlive.co.za.